Welcome to this seminar, co-sponsored by the Buddhist Women's Association and the Bitswing Education Committee. Is Moss here? Those of you who are from the Education Committee, do you want to raise your hands, please? So this seminar is one of the first seminars that BWA is sponsoring, co-sponsoring. We've never had a seminar like this before here at the Bitswing. So we are very happy to welcome Reverend Dr. Ken Tanaka. As you have received a choir on his seminar, he has a wealth of background, and you can see it on, reflected on the screen right now. I'm kind of engrossed about your name there, Chaka Tanaka. Sounds like chocolate. Chocolate Tanaka there. <laughs> so, um, Reverend Tanaka and I go way, way back. Way back when he and I both had black hair. <laughs> so, we were involved together in the BCA National Board and National Council meetings. I've attended uh, several retreats at the San Luis Obispo Retreat Center with him as one of our lead uh, leaders of the retreats and with him and Dr. Kendi Akapochi at the time on his retreats up in the Santa Cruz Mountain and lately, more lately, the two of his similar seminars uh, that he's conducting today. So we go way, way back and I'm really, really happy that Limba Sakamoto has allowed us to have him here today so you could enjoy him. And I'm sure that you will find this afternoon very, very worthwhile as he goes through his seminar and you follow along with the handout that he's given you. So I would like to give you Reverend Dr. Ken Tanaka. OK, thank you, Sumi. Um, I wish to, uh, first of all, thank the uh, Betsing and the Education Committee, uh, and especially Sumi. Uh, we've been wa working on this for the past two years, and finally we are here, and so I feel very fortunate. Um, by the way, my Chako Tanaka, Chako is one of the, the cats, the stray cats, the feral cats that I took care of, or I'm taking care of back in Japan. And uh, so, uh, unfortunately, Chaco no longer started to come back to our, you know, every morning these cats would come to our uh, door, back door, and uh, it's a whole story, whole Dharma talk I can do on, on cats, and, and, but, but uh, anyway, uh, it's been almost 10 years since we started feeding, and the cats, uh, little by little, they started to, you know, disappear, but we still have three left. So anyway, so that's, that's where I get, not from chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> not, anyway, okay, so um, uh, we have two hours, uh, well actually to four o'clock, and I need to leave right after the seminar is over because of the, our misunderstanding. <laughs> I thought the seminar beginning of this week, I thought the seminar was on Sunday. <laughs> Not on Saturday. Fortunately, I sent Sumi an email, you know, for the last minute details, and she writes back, it's Saturday, not Sunday. <laughs> and I said, oh my God, I mean, oh my Buddha. You know? <laughs> and, uh, and my wife says, you did it again? <laughs> and then we have a few discussions. <laughs> but fortunately, um, I had nothing planned uh, at this time, and I can still make our important family dinner back in El Cerrito, uh, which starts at four. So if I get there by six, then I'll be, I will be forgiven. <laughs> anyway, oh, I forgot, this is being recorded. <laughs> I hope my wife doesn't see it. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, I just want to say a few words about, you know, my uh, connection to, you know, Bay Area. I grew up in Mountain View, started Buddhism in Mountain View. But uh, San Jose was like the, the big city for us. 
you know, and we used to hang out here at the gymnasium and, and many dances and many talks. And so I feel like this is my, my home as well. And I also attended San Jose State for the first year and a half of my college years. So, uh, you know, San Jose is uh, one of my homes. Okay. Um, so, um, oops, okay, what, what happened here? Um, we have uh, two sessions, and basically, um, you know, the first session, I want to go through the essence of Jodo Shinshu, using my favorite story of the drowning sailor, which some of you have already seen and heard. Uh, it's at the... Um, it's at the heart of the uh, ocean book that was being sold. Okay. So uh, I'll talk about this, but with you know, new, new input, I hope. And then the second hour, I want to do a little bit of concentrate a little bit more on things related to how we practice or uh, maybe Nembutsu meditation, how we look at our mind and how we become more inward and sensitive. That's uh, more... Um, uh, specialized, so I will do on the second hour. But the first hour, I want to go through rather quickly to give you the um, the as the to topic of our discussion, introduction to the essence. Okay, essence, and so I want to do the essence part first, partly because you know Buddhism is growing in America, but. Um, and the groups that, that are growing are, as you probably know, Zen, Tibetan, and Theravada, or Southeast Asian forms. And the reason why they're doing so well is because they all have one thing in common. What do you think that is? Meditation. Meditation is one, one practice that uh, is attractive to uh, newcomers. And that is why Buddhism is actually a growing religion in the world. So I'll talk about that as well. Okay, so, um, okay, and I just want to uh, lay out, lay down some uh, my, my, uh, my principles of, the, of my presentation. First of all, and you know, I have so much stuff um, that I'll be putting up here, and, but everything is in your handout. So if you didn't understand, uh, uh, you can certainly um, you know, go through these, this later. And then if you really have questions, you can always send me an email at Chako Tanaka, okay? And oh, I, I forgot to mention that there's another sheet of paper which actually uh, has two sections. First part, uh, if you, if you, can you look at this? This one page uh, questionnaire on the talk, and it, it actually goes about two thirds of the way down. And the first section, this is actually, I wanted this in the front page, and the, the, uh, but anyway, it's okay. So uh, there's some uh, feedback you can give me. And then right here, if you're interested in getting my Buddhist column, which I started beginning of this year, I send out once every three months by email, free of charge, of course. And, you know, about uh, what's going on in Japan, Buddhism in Japan, uh, and my thoughts about, you know, Buddhism. And so uh, you give your name and your email address. Now, the, the uh, one third from the bottom here is this questionnaire on the Nembutsu contemplation, which we'll, we'll be doing in the second hour. And I would like your feedback if you can, because I will be actually using this as part of my research. Um, it's something that is probably very new to Shin Buddhism. Because as you know, Shin Buddhism, we don't have meditation. I mean, real thoroughgoing meditation. But actually, Pure Land Buddhism has had a form of practice called contemplation for a thousand years. Um, when Buddhist, Pure Land Buddhism went to China, um, the main form of practice was contemplation. But with Shinran Shonin, our founder of Jodo Shinshu School, he kind of put that aside. But he practiced for 20 long years contemplation. 
And so today we say, well, we know the conclusion that he left for us. That is that we don't have to really do rigorous contemplation. So we don't have to do that at all. So we don't talk about it at all. And we say it's self-powered. You know, that, this is a very delicate issue, self-powered. But self-power and self-effort are different. We have, to make self, we have to make effort. That's why Buddhism is a religion of awakening, not a religion of belief. Okay? Um, so often Jodo Shinshu is considered, oh, you're a Christian Buddhist. <laughs> I've been, you know, called, I mean, said that to my face at a meeting, you know, gathering. I introduced myself, I'm Ken Tanaka, I belong to Jodo Shinshu. He goes, oh, so you're the Christian Buddhist. And so I know why this Zen Buddhist person said that. And, and, and partly because on the surface, Shin Buddhism smacks of, well, seems like Christianity or Christian teaching. But, uh, but there's much, uh, there are similarities, but there are fundamental differences. So I say more and more, also in Japan, I say Buddhism is a religion of awakening. But for awakening, we have to make effort. We have to, and, and contemplation is one, if you so wish, it's not mandatory. But in our busy lives, uh, you know, we, uh, it, it's, we need help in trying to find more uh, settledness, self-centeredness, uh, be, be more, a little bit more inward. Because if you're not really inward, you cannot fully understand and appreciate Buddhism. Um, so that's why it's a little different from the Judeo-Christian tradition where you have a omniscient, omnipotent God and God plays such an important role. We don't have a God in that sense. We have, you know, maybe spirit uh, that, that the Christians speak about, you know, the, 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 the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but not God that created you know, everything and all of us. Okay, so um, anyway, uh, if you participate in the contemplation, which you'll be doing in the second hour, if you could answer very simple questions, you know, yes and no, yes and no, okay? All right, so let's, now having, I like uh, my talks to be uh, participatory, and, and I may just uh, point, ask someone, uh, do you have any questions or do you have any comments? No. Okay, because uh, I taught at uh, uh, a university in, in Japan for 20 years and then I was teaching at IBS, so um, I, I like to get the students involved. So if you're called upon, or you know, you can just say pass. <laughs> you don't have to answer and next, no. Okay, so uh, hey, we were here. So I, I, I'm interested in, you know, going beyond uh, Shin in Japan. Uh, the more, so I've spent the past 20 years in Japan. And Shin Buddhism is, has, the interpretation of Shin is very much dictated by Japanese culture, I think. And um, in one way of describing this is, it's rather, you know, passive, demure. Um, and, and that is why, uh, the received tradition in America has that quality of not being as active. And I think in American culture, there needs to, there needs to be greater element of activeness. And, and I, I base that on, on, on what Shinran Shonin, you know, the founder, has uh, uh, left as uh, shown us. Uh, I want to do a bird's eye view. And, and so I mentioned that already. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, things to digest, but uh, if you can just take one thing, one or two things away, then hopefully this session will have been meaningful. And I'm hoping that this kind of talk that I will be doing here and then also later uh, this month in September, that uh, it will lead to my, the sequel to my ocean book. So I'm calling Ocean 2. You'll be a little bit more advanced. Um, and so um, you will be 
whatever input that you can give, you'll be helping me uh, in uh, composing or creating Ocean 2. Okay. Now, um, the topic is, um, you know, peace and happiness for oneself and others. Okay. Fundamentally, Buddhism, like all true religions, it should lead to one's peace and happiness for yourself and for others. Okay? We cannot forget the others. Okay? Uh, sometimes we turn inward and say, oh, I'm happy, but that's not the end of it. Uh, so, um, in Joro Shinshi Buddhism, the ultimate goal is to become Buddha. And once you become Buddha, you don't just stay in the pure land, you know. There's nobody there. All the Buddhas are back in Saha world and other worlds to help others. Now, whether you, you know, uh, you, you, need, you don't really have to worry about, you know, how does it really happen? How do you come back? The essence is the spirit of it. The spirit is that you, once you are, you have helped yourself, then you automatically want to help others. That's the nature of awakening. Okay, so Shindan Shoni here, this word, I l oh. Oh. Going to sleep. Well, um, so, I wonder why this is happening. It's trying to connect to the Wi Fi. Oh, okay. So, anyway, um, life is a bumpy road. <laughs> Which is one of the, if you learn anything today, life is a bumpy road. Really. Isn't that, isn't that true? Yeah. And that is why we have, um, you know, religion. Okay. Okay, can you all kind of uh, read this together? Shinran Shoni, he is an example. He, you know, when you look at his statue, he seems like stern, you know, and kind of focused. But he has the dimension, an element, where he talks about how happy he is, okay? With the one, two, three. Oh, how happy I am. My mind, heart is firmly planted in the soil, the universal vow. And I allow my thoughts to flow freely in the inconceivable Dharma ocean. So he's free, you know, his, his thoughts are free. And, but fundamentally, he's rooted in the vow of uh, Amida Buddha. But here, the, how happy I am, you know. Without that, you know, this doesn't really mean much. You know, why, do we, why are we involved in, you know, religion if it doesn't lead you to, to happiness in this life and hereafter? The Myokonis are the people in Joro Shinshu who have become uh, awakened. We could awaken people. And Genza is one person. And just to give you a, a, a sample of, have you heard of Genza? Uh, he's one of the Myokonins. Myokonins are enlightened people with Shinjin awakening. Okay, so Shinjin, you, I'm sure you heard, Shinjin is the Joro Shinshu version of awakening in this life. Not afterwards, and not, not after you die. You know, that's, that's the image of uh, Pure Land Buddhism. Oh, you, all you want to do is to go to the Pure Land. No, no. The aim is in this life, realize um, uh, a form of awakening, uh, enlightenment. Uh, not fully blown. You know, we still have our gas. You know gas? <laughs> Greed, anger, and stupidity. Okay? So if you, there's another thing, okay? Please learn this gas. <laughs> it's pretty popular in BCA. Greed, anger, and stupidity. Okay? These are called the defilements okay? or afflictions. But we want to make it simple, easy to understand. So, um, okay? the aim of Buddhism is to overcome gas or release gas, but just don't do it here. <laughs> okay, Genza. Genza was a Myokonin. Uh, he was man, person of uh, Shinjin Awakening. He worked all day uh, as a farmer in the rice field, and it's raining cats and dogs all day. It's drenching wet. Finally, at the end of the day, he's walking back to his home, and the minister from the temple happens to see him and says, Oh, Genza-san, 
you know, you must be, you know, uh, feeling terrible. I mean, it must be hard on you, a lot of work. And all he says is, I'm grateful. I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. And he says, how come you're grateful in your situation? And he says, I'm grateful that the, no the holes of my nose are pointing downwards. <laughs> you get it? Yeah. If you were pointing upwards, you know, he would have probably drowned, okay? <laughs> so this, I love this story, right? Yeah. I assume she's really cracking up here. <laughs> yeah, if you can, you know, because when, it, when you come down to it, a person of happiness, at peace, someone who is satisfied with what you have. Um, so there's a term called uh, little desire, and know that what you have, or be satisfied with what you have. Uh, in Japanese, shōyoku chisoku, which I so genza represents someone who uh, is is um, ex, who is satisfied. I guess is a word uh, grateful for what you have. Simple as that. Simp grateful for what you have. Okay, so um, and he is an example of uh, happy person with, with um, happiness and peace. And he's not just an exception. There are, were millions of people throughout the Jodo Shinshu history, or Buddhist history, who have found that kind of peace. And I was thinking about that, and I, I thought of uh, many ministers of the past, our teachers, um, and one person in particular is Reverend Tokunaga, which many of you know. He was a Rimban here, and you know, he was also a minister before and became a Rimban. And he just came to my mind. You know, he's, uh, he's, he's like Genza, you know, seemed very, had a sense of deep gratitude, and often very uh, soft and, you know, happy demeanor, that it was always nice to see him, you know? So Reverend Tokunaga, you know? And uh, so, um, if you knew him, uh, he would be a, an exemplar. Okay, Buddhism is, just as, uh, you know, since um, when I was growing up in the 1960s, I was afraid and, and, and didn't have confidence to say I'm a Buddhist because Buddhism was not well known. Now Buddhism is an American religion with over 1% uh, of Americans are Buddhists. Okay? And if you add people who are people who sympathize with Buddhism, we call them nightstand Buddhists. Now, I don't have time to explain why that. Okay, you can nightstand Buddhists, and also people who have been influenced by Buddhism. They would amount to about 10% of the U.S. population. That's, you know, over 30 million people. That was not the case in the early 1960s, you know. And um, so, uh, I'm actually uh, completing a book on um, American Buddhism for youth, scouts, and the young at heart. So you'll come out next year, and there I talk about all this to give uh, young Buddhists in America uh, a confidence in their religion. Not only do we have, you know, uh, famous people who are Buddhists, from Tiger Woods to, you know, Richard Gere, and, and, but, but, you know, it's become an American religion that uh, is applicable and makes sense to uh, modern Americans. And this is also true in Western Europe as well, Australia, New Zealand, and many of the so-called advanced countries. Buddhism is becoming much more uh, accepted. So, because it's a religion of awakening, no long, not a religion of belief, and we are not Christian Buddhists, as I said. Also, you know, um, if you have grandchildren who you know, want to know about Buddhism, uh, tell them Buddhism is a world religion, one of the three world religions. Uh, it's the smallest compared to Christianity and Islam, but it's the oldest. Uh, there are 2.2 um, billion Christians, maybe 1.6 Islam, Muslims, and 500 million Buddhists. But Buddhism is the oldest, by 500 years. 500 years is a long time, you know? Okay, so I, I think these are things you should know. Uh, we should have knowledge about our religion in order to have confidence, okay?
And I talked about this already. Another important thing is that first person, Buddhism is a religion of first person. It's not about the other guy or about you. It's about me, me. You know? And that's how Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, Shinran Shoni, they began their paths as uh, because they were concerned about the, the issues that they had, the spiritual, existential issues uh, about themselves. So it's a per first person. And if you're a Buddhist, you must be a seeker. Seeker. Don't just be a B Buddhist. And you know B Buddhist? There are many B Buddhists. B stands for Bazaar Buddhists. <laughs> Bored Buddhists. People who come for board meetings, but never step into the hondo. Okay, what else? Uh, basketball Buddhists. Okay, these are the major ones. B Buddhists, board Buddhists, basketball Buddhists, and bazaar Buddhists. You know, bazaar Buddhists, they come once a year to help out at the temple, which we're grateful for their help, but they should come more often and come to the hondo and listen to the teachings. And there are others like Bingo Buddhists, and there are, I hope you're not bored Buddhists, not bored, but bored, because you, hadn't, you really don't see the meaning in, in studying Buddhism. So, uh, if you're going to be, if you claim to be Buddhist, let's be Buddhist Buddhists, okay? And you can do a basket, you can do basketball, you can do bingo, bazaar, and, and we certainly need people to, on the board, you know? But, um, okay, so, but the per is the first person as a seeker of Buddhism. Okay, now um, my uh, I, this is what I often do is uh, unfortunately you can't see very well. Okay, can you see this diagram below right here? Okay, uh, I think uh, I suggest that uh, such a big temple, <laughs> great facilities. I think this whiteboard does not match your <laughs> potential, you know? When I speak in Japan, even little temples, they have this huge white board. And I come here this morning, I said, <laughs> okay, put that on the agenda, okay, for the next one. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Heck, you can take a part of my honorarium, if I'm getting any, and apply it to this. No, really, I mean it. <laughs> so, Okay, so All right. <laughs> horizontal axis and vertical axis. I'm just going to talk about these two first. And if you look at uh, right here, um, everyday world. We live on the horizontal. Horizontal is the everyday world, school, temple, work. And it's up and down. Life is a bumpy road. Okay. And unfortunately, many people in the world only have that to rely upon. They're always kind of external. They're doing things, they're busy and doing things. That's fine. But if you notice, it's up and down. When you hit the bottom is when things don't go your way. We call these difficulties. Difficulties are things that don't go your way. But whether or not that becomes suffering, deep suffering or not, is up to your vertical level uh, axis. This is the Buddhist path or any true religion. It can be Christianity, Islam, you know. Um, but uh, for our sake, this is the Buddhist path. This gives you the mooring, the grounding, you know. Uh, uh, Shinran Shonin said, how happy I am, my mind and heart are planted in the soil of Buddha's universal vow, planted in the soil of the Dharma. So that's why you have to have the Dharma to deal with the ups and downs. So higher up you go, giving an analogy, higher, if you go up um, 30,000 feet in a plane, and if you look, look at the Rocky Mountains, they will look relatively flat. Right? So the higher up you go, the ups and downs of life become much more smooth, much more uh, acceptable. Uh, so um, um, I don't know where you are on this. Uh, uh, I hope you have this path, the vertical path. And some of you are 
you know, way up here. Some of you have what we call Shinjin. And Shinjin, again, is the joy of awakening. And then uh, I'll talk about Shinjin a little bit later. But uh, this is like Satori for us. Okay? We cannot become, f right at the very top is full Buddhahood, to become fully Buddha. What that means is that you have overcome gas, greed, anger, and stupidity completely. But Shinran Shonin said he could not attain that level. And, but he reached the level of Shinjin awakening. And I, I believe for us, this is good enough. You know, um, uh, if we can reach this level, then I think your, our lives uh, will have meant something meaningful. It, the, uh, it would have been worth having been born a human being. And, um, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this because there's always a question of, do I have Shinjin? You know, that's a, it's a big question um, for some people, but I think we need to address that. And I, I, I will try to do that. Anyway, so, um, uh, uh, not just the, we don't live just on the, uh, we live on the horizontal level, but we need this to make, um, find greater peace and happiness on the horizontal level. So, um, okay. and then Joro Shinshu has, and, and I will discuss it later, but it ha actually has another dimension, and that is the circle. This one here. What that means is that wherever you are, you are already embraced in a circle of compassion of Amida Buddha. But in order to awaken to that, you, you, there needs to be a little bit more of an effort to really seek and understand yourself. Okay. Okay, uh, we've gone half an hour. So, can I, um, Mike, mm -hmm. can I ask you, since you're sitting in the front, um, so far, whatever I said, uh, anything you didn't understand or, you know, any comment or anything? So, uh, so you talked about Shinjin being the Jodo Shinshu version of awakening. That, that's not been my understanding of the term. Um, and I, I also recently had been reading about whether or not it's possible to attain awakening in a single lifetime. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, a concept. Um, okay. Can, Sokushin Jobutsu. Uh, so, Sokushin Jobutsu, yeah. It, is Shinjin really a full awakening? Yeah, okay. Uh, the question is, is Shinjin really full awakening? So uh, these terms are, you know, we need to be clear about the terms. Awakening I'm using as Buddha, uh, um, full awakening is becoming a Buddha. Okay, full awakening. So, Pari Nirvana. Pari Nirvana, yeah, Nirvana. But um, awakening uh, has levels, levels. And, um, and if you look at the Buddhist scriptures, you have what is called a stream enterer in basic Buddhism. You enter the stream, and that guarantees that you will become fully awakened. Uh, and Joro Shinshu Shinjin is at that first level of awakening. And I, I have written articles on this. I'll be happy to share this with you because it's, you know, it's a little bit more complicated. But um, uh, uh, see, actually, greed, anger, and hatred, we're born with it. To be a human being, even living creatures, we need to have that to some extent in order to, to live. But uh, there are other afflictions that, um, that we can overcome. And these are more um, um, attained uh, later in life, as we grow up. And they become an obstacle, basically become self-centered, you know, self-centeredness. And that can be reduced to, to uh, quite an extent. But anyway, um, so uh, yes, you can attain it in this life. Joro Shinshi Buddhism, is not just being born in a pure land and become Buddha, but it has to make a difference here and, in, here and now. And Shinran is actually a great innovator in that. 
in the, uh, you know, the Pure Land Buddhism is much older through China, India, India, China, but Shinran is the one that really emphasized the Shinjin, which can be attained here and now. And what that does is that it guarantees that you become a Buddha after you die. You know, I mean that because we still have our you know body. You know, but your mind has been transformed. Okay, so okay, all right. So let's go. Uh, I want to, uh, seven phases of, of Shinjin, uh, way, Shin Buddhist way. And you know, you probably, some of you have heard the 10 Oxford uh, story, uh, 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 story of the 10 Oxford uh, of Zen Buddhism. And it's very famous. But what I want to do is to kind of create a, something for uh, Shin Buddhism. And so, my, the story of the drowning sailor uh, is what I hope will be a kind of a, um, uh, the Shin version of the 10 Oxford uh, story. Okay, so here we have a, and I'm gonna go through this rather quickly, but I kind of illustrated here. I would have done a better job if I had a, a bigger, <laughs> bigger bullet. <laughs> but anyway, can you see a, at least, you know? Okay. Um, here you have a, a, a sailor, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some pictures of this. A sailor on a big boat uh, leaving a tropical island, okay? And so about five, six hours on the high seas, uh, he right here and his buddies are on the deck looking at the beautiful sunset. That's phase one, boarding the ship. Number two, but all of a sudden there's a big, um, the, the ship um, moves and sh tilts and he is thrown overboard. He falls off the ship, okay, right here. And then he cannot just stay there, so he begins to swim to reach an island that he saw about an hour ago, okay. So I, I, but he's not quite sure of the direction, but he starts swimming here, number three. And then, um, I, but he swims and swims, but he doesn't see the island, he gets tired, starts taking in water, and he says, oh, this is the end, I'm gonna drown. Just at that time, from deep, from the bottom of the ocean, he hears a voice, let go. Let go of your striving. And, and so he says, oh, that's right. And then he turns overboard, uh, uh, turns over and stretches and releases all the, the, the tension and, uh, and then lo and behold, what happens? That he is, the ocean picks him up and allows him to float. Just a few seconds ago, he thought he was gonna die. But now, he's all right, accepted just as you are by the ocean. And ocean is of course a metaphor for other power, the vow, Amira. Okay, so he's overjoyed, his great joy. So here's that joy again. In Buddhism, there's joy. There's, you know, gratitude, joy. And so, and next, he can't stay in the middle of the ocean even though he's very happy, you know. He has to, he has a family and he has to get back. So he starts to swim again, but this time, unlike here, it is, is with ease. He has confidence that whenever he gets tired, he can just let go and the ocean will embrace him. And so he can see things better and find the direction. Think, he starts thinking about his friends and he finally makes it to the island. And so he reached the island, but that's not the end. Then he gets on a little boat. And what does he do? He goes out to the ocean again to look for his buddies who may be in the same circumstance. So that's the benefiting oh, for yourself, but then benefiting others. So that's the uh, gist of the story. Okay, and um, uh, I'm gonna be probably repeating and probably run out of time, but well, here we go. Uh, actually, I, you know, uh, I, this story I wrote in the Ocean book and it's been translated into Japanese and a 
minister in Hiroshima liked it so much, he made a kamishibai, you know, the paper drama, the, ja the traditional Japanese drama you write. And then uh, he, and he showed this to me. And uh, so I've been using this um, <coughs> uh, for my presentations. So boarding a ship. Okay, maybe if you can kind of, again, uh, read together with me. Okay, one, two, three. Sometime Time had passed since we came to the tropical island. What a beautiful ocean. What a beautiful view. What a soothing breeze. Okay, now, uh, significance of boarding the ship. Uh, so now we're, we're looking at the total picture now. Remember I said my presentation will be on the, on the bird's eye view of the Shin Buddhist path. So um, boarding the boat signifies the fact that we're born a human being. Okay. Now it's good news, bad news. Or bad news, good news. Which one do you want to hear first? The bad news. Okay. From a Buddhist perspective, uh, the fact that we are born a human, we're still in the tr transmigration or samsara or reincarnation. From an Indian spiritual view, it's still a bad news. Why? Because we're not enlightened. We're not awakened. And we are prone to suffering and difficulties. And we all know the difficulties. Okay? So, transmigration. And I'm not going to go into details here, but the six levels of heavenly beings all the way down to hellish beings. And we are right here in the middle, the, uh, the second level. Actually, humans are better off than heavenly beings because heavenly beings supposedly have no suffering. Everything, go, everything goes their way. But because of that, they don't know what happiness is, nor will, do they make effort to find the ultimate happiness, which is awakening. Okay? So human beings, we have both. So we become inspired. We know what the difficulties are, our suffering is, and we try to do something about it. So from the Buddhist perspective, human beings are in the best position to be born, uh, best position to be, um, uh, to, to attain awakening. That is why it's good news do you know the story of a turtle and a floating wood metaphor? Well, there is a, the chance of us being born a human being is like this. Do you have a huge ocean like the Pacific Ocean? Once every hundred years, a, a turtle who has difficulty with his vision, a vision impaired turtle, comes up from the bottom of the ocean to the surface. And there is a a uh, wood, a piece of wood that's floating, you know, and there are, you know, some holes in it. So the chance of us being born a human being is like this turtle coming up every 100 years and poking its head <laughs> in the little hole. That is the metaphor. That's how rare and precious it is to be born a human being. Okay, so the reason why it's uh, precious is because we have the best chance of finding a uh, awakening in this life. In okay, second one, second phase two here is, of course, he, fought, he had fallen off the boat, and that it, it signifies encountering difficulties. Okay, what are the difficulties? Oh, okay, let's read this one. One, two, three. So Oh no, splash! Now help, help me, but the ship keeps going, unaware that a sailor had fallen overboard. As for that sailor, he can't see any of his buddies, so he doesn't know what's happened to them. Okay. So, the, the falling off the ship, do you feel like you have fallen off the ship? Sometimes. Sometimes. I think all of us do. You know, and sometimes all of us feel like we've fallen off. And that, that, is, what, that is one of the reasons why, you know, we seek. Um, and it's especially true in Buddhism. So these are the eight. 
And these, I'm not going to go through this, it's in your handout, but, you know, birth, aging, illness, death, being separated from our loved ones uh, in this life and through death, um, moving away, meeting up with people you hate. Of course, you don't know anybody like that, right? <laughs> at work, at work, you, you know, you can live with it, but if you had someone like that in your family, then that's, it's pretty tough. And, um, and, um, one of my reasons for getting into Buddhism has to do with the fact that, one, I was afraid of death uh, at a young age, and secondly, my parents didn't get along very well. And so they were always arguing at home. And so I felt part of this, uh, you know, quite early in life, and Buddhism gave me a way to find solution. So um, we don't want to talk about suffering very much, but, you know, uh, in our private lives, we all have some level of this, you know, not getting the, what we, we, we sought. That happens all the time. Okay, uh, I have some good jokes here, but I just I, I, mm, I wish I had more time, but I, I'll tell you this one. Why is birth a good, uh, uh, why is birth one of the difficulties? Okay, can I ask you? I don't know. You don't know. It's, most people don't know and it's probably that's, that's fine because you know when we have uh, you know uh, babies born in our lives and we're so happy everybody congratulates. I, I'm just back here and I'm seeing our first grandson. He's six months old and uh, you know you know I mean he's the cutest <laughs> thing you can you know. Uh, but um, why do we uh, oh boy can, can someone uh, uh, who, who's, where's Al? <laughs> he was there. Uh, can, uh, what? You need, okay. to, you need to do two things. You need to uh, turn off Wi-Fi and you need to set the screen saver. Off. Turn, off, turn this off? No, Wi-Fi. Oh, that's on Wi-Fi. That's Bluetooth, right? Uh, I don't know. That's Bluetooth. Yeah. You need to turn off Wi-Fi so it doesn't keep working for Wi-Fi and also shut, oh. shut off the screensaver so it doesn't sleep. Well, I don't know. Okay, let, let's do that during the uh, break. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so... Uh, so anyway, while you're a baby, you were protected by the mother's womb. You're in this nice, warm, warm, beautiful environment. Now you're out in the open, it's cold, you're stark naked, and 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 somebody's mm. slapping you so you start <laughs> yeah. crying. I mean, all of a sudden you're into this harsh environment where you yeah. are so protected. Okay, that, that, that's partially true. Uh, essentially, the birth is, a, uh, is one of the sufferings because, remember we talk about transmigration? You're born into this life and you will encounter aging, illness, and death. Especially illness and death. So, um, uh, so this, uh, this joke that I was going to tell you. There was a very fervently devout Buddhist medical examiner and he got fired. Why? Because on a death certificate, every time he wrote the same thing. Same thing. He wrote, the cause of death, birth. <laughs> well, why did you die? Because you were born. If you weren't born, then you wouldn't die. You don't have to go through illness and, you know, all this and aging. And there's great amount of truth to that. That is why Indian view is you transcend transmigration. You get rid of all that. Okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, please think about these and, and uh, you know, we have all experienced it, and we will all experience it. For, for, uh, hopefully, as you study Buddhism, that, you know, illness and death, especially death, will no longer become a source of suffering, you know, uh, especially for yourself. Um, but, you know, being a human being and with families, we're not monks and nuns, so that uh, when we encounter the passing of our loved ones, it's tough. It, it's, you can't escape it. But um, uh, somehow, uh, through seeking 
you come to greater realization and acceptance, especially for your for uh, yourself. And just want to say that you know I said that I began Buddhist because partly because of my fear of my own personal death. I'm still not you know looking forward to dying, but uh, if it happens soon, I think I'm much better off than when I was, you know, a, a teenager or 20s or 30s when I started the path. So, um, I just wanted to mention that part. Okay, um, phase three is, is, is a part, uh, is, is the swimming to the island. Swimming to the island. Um, and this represents um, pursuing a Buddhist life to lead a life of meaning and happiness and attain awakening. So for Shinran Shonin, you know, at nine years old, he became a monk. And for the next 20 years, he, he uh, trained himself on, on the, in the monastery on Mount Hiei. And so for us, we're not monks and nuns, but uh, we lead our ordinary lives, but we have our spiritual lives, so we come to uh, a to, to temple like this and to uh, pursue in our own way. And so the question, okay, I, I just read a, the story, okay, so he fell off, he started to swim to the island because, you know, he doesn't want to drown. Okay, one, two, three. I don't want to drown. No way. I'm going to drown. The sailor began swimming toward the Let me see which way was I don't remember. But I'll drown if I don't swim. He begins to swim with all his might. Okay. So, um, beginning of the path, and just wanted to mention again the importance of three treasures. So, if you're Buddhist, uh, well, Often people ask, uh, when do you become a Buddhist? And, uh, well, I think uh, when you take refuge in the three treasures, the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And this is uh, throughout the Buddhist, all the different schools of Buddhism. This is one thing that all the Buddhist schools have in common. And, and again, it, it, this represents a voluntary effort. You know, no one is telling you, no one is saying, if you don't, uh, take interest in Buddhism, that is a sin. Which differs somewhat from certain interpretations of Christianity, because in Christianity, that if you don't take interest in God or turn to God, it is considered a sin. But not everybody, but there is that, that kind of a, an idea. But in Buddhism, Buddha often said, Ehi pasiko, come here and check it out. Come here and see. You know. So if you're not interested then, well, we just have to wait till your conditions mature. But uh, um, most thoughtful people, people who live lives and experience difficulties, they will have interest. So come here and see. And then Buddhism also emphasizes, you know, kind of um, um, confidence in yourself to understand, to awaken, to, to, to assess the teachings. So, when he died, the last words, what word? Make the Dharma your lamp, make yourself the lamp, or make yourself the lamp, and make the Dharma the lamp. Well, you, you just don't make up your teachings on your own, but you have the Dharma, the teachings. But it has to make sense for you, because it's a religion of awakening, not a religion of belief. Religion of belief is something that that we don't fully understand, we kind of believe what others tell us. But Buddhism is experiential, and, uh, uh, and that is what is attractive to a lot of contemporary Americans and Europeans and modern Japanese and etc. Okay, and here the question then becomes, okay, we have to make effort, we have to seek. Uh, so the drowning sailor is swimming, that's the making the effort to understand the teachings. And Jodo Shinshu, we say what? What is our practice? We don't really have, a, you know, like, you know, in Zen or Theravada, we don't say you sit, you know, sit in meditation. But we, we say things like, uh, you know, listen to the teachings. But uh, 
Uh, we don't really say too much about what you can do at home uh, in, the, in the privacy of your home or you know, six other days of the week, what you do. But we actually do uh, have, especially in America, we have adopted a basic Buddhism, basic Buddhist teachings, which are part of our Jodo Shinshu teaching. And, uh, and that's found in the golden chain. I think golden chain is very uh, effective and, and, and I think it's probably the one teaching that all the Jodo Shinshu people know. And even my kids who are now into their late, uh, 30, late 20s and 30s, uh, they're Shin Buddhists and I said, well, what's, what's, what does Shin Buddhism say? And they <laughs> recite the golden chain. And in it you have, I will think pure and beautiful thoughts, to say pure and beautiful words, and to do pure and beautiful deeds. So this is kind of the, uh, 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 it's, it's the, in a nutshell, what Buddhist practice or Buddhist seeking is about. And uh, uh, Jodo Shinshu, we tend to uh, not request too much of what we can do. And so, um, so I think I put it, oh, okay, I, I put it down here. Now, having said all this, here, here's the three actions of thoughts, words, and deeds. These are the, uh, these are, you know, our total being, you know, what we think, what we say, and what we do. Three actions. And, and th this is fundamental to the Buddhist teachings and throughout all the denominations. Okay. But of course you have a Theravada or Southeast Asian Buddhism and we have the Mahayana. And which one do we belong to? Mahayana. Mahayana, right? Northern branch. Northern branch. And within Mahayana we have Pure Land branch. And so we're part of Mahayana but part of Pure Land and then uh, we're Jodo Shinshu. But among the Mahayana we have this teaching called the Six Paramitas or Six Perfections, which we have learned in Dharma schools. Okay? And I think this is a very good um, uh, uh, guideline. Uh, but essentially it comes down to three actions. What we think, what we say, and what we do. Okay? And I, ha I go into depth uh, all the, in details of each of these. So let me just... Uh, uh, just go through quickly, okay? Uh, sharing, the first one is dana, right? And dana is not only giving money, but you can do it through action called non-material dana. Every day you can do, practice this at home and at work is, you know, a, a use of the body uh, up to helping someone carry a, a luggage or uh, that's one example. Uh, mental thought, thoughtfulness, you know, when someone is really down, you say, you know, how are you doing? Can I, you know, if I'm not intruding, um, you know, I, I'm, ha I'm here for, to, 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 to listen, if you, if you wish. Things like that. And then and verbal thoughts, kind gaze, you know, nice smile, nice countenance, um, um, and gentle countenance, and and here is giving up one seat. I just, uh, here in, uh, in, uh, in the Bay Area, you don't use tran public transportation so much, but in Japan, where we ride all the time, you know, this is something that I encourage my students to practice, but without anything in return. You know, this is the key to dana. Non, you're not expecting, like you give money to Betsing, next, at the next uh, newsletter of the month, you don't see your name, and you say, where's my name? No, that, that is not true dana. Whether or not it's there, or not, you know, you feel gratified. However, Shinran Shonin says, we cannot do that completely. If you donate a certain amount of money, you will want your name on your newsletter. If it doesn't appear, you're a little peeved. Okay. And that's the essence of another dimension of Shinshu that is important for us to keep in mind. We can never, we have these ideals, but we cannot fully attain them. But to acknowledge that, 
By acknowledging, you understand Shinshu better. But anyway, uh, recently, you know, I was offered a seat in the train. Uh, I'm not getting much reaction here, but uh, <laughs> maybe you don't experience it, right? Uh, if you're at a certain age, if you look, you know, like a senior, well, th this was in the priority section, you know, where people are prone to, to give up their seat. So now I don't stand in the priority section. <laughs> Do you understand this feeling? Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, you, okay. So earlier I was saying, you know, uh, aging, you know, aging is, uh, is really not a problem in itself. We make it a problem, but I'm not quite fully awakened one, you know? <laughs> that is why I no longer stand in the priority section. <laughs> so, anyway, I wish I could talk to you more about this. This is, you know, uh, anyway, okay. Oh boy, okay. So, bodily, speech, and mind. So there is another uh, part of the, the second of the Six paramitas are precepts. And you know, you're familiar with the Ten Commandments, but uh, there's something kind of similar. Um, these are not commandments, but it, again, it's voluntary. You know? If you want to go up, the, if you want to seek, you want to practice. And so you have this. So uh, again, um, what you say, what you do, and how you think. And there's the gas, okay? All right, uh, I'm just going to go through this fast, and if you want, endurance and effort, again, I mentioned already, it's tough to be a Buddhist, or tough to be, you know, truly religious, because you're go going against the grain of society. So you have to uh, have, you know, uh, uh, commitment and in sense of endurance. And meditation, we don't really have meditation in Joro Shinshu. That is one of the reasons why people are not attracted to Joro Shinshu. When I was a minister for three years at Southern Alameda County Buddhist Church, I used to get phone calls saying, when's your meditation class? I said, we don't do them. Hung up. <laughs> thank you, no thank you. So I decided, I said, yes, we do meditation. And have them come to the temple. And I began to improvise a kind of a, a meditation, or contemplation. Again, from the Pure Land, we have some Pure Land no, pure land, actually, pure land med contemplation is older than Zen meditation in China. But we have kind of abandoned in Shin Buddhism. But anyway, so I'm going to do this in the second hour. Okay, so this is kind of very, um, it takes a little bit more time, so. Okay, this, we're doing paramitas. We have dana, precepts, yeah? endurance, effort, meditation, and then... Number six is wisdom. And uh, I think I'm going to uh, end with this one for the first hour. We're going, going, okay, wisdom, again, in Joro Shinshi, we don't talk too much about wisdom ourselves. We talk about wisdom and compassion of who? Amida Buddha. Amida Buddha, right? Amida Buddha has wisdom and compassion. But we don't really talk about wisdom and compassion for ourselves as much as I think we should because we're Buddhists, a religion of awakening. And so, um, but uh, in basic Buddhism we have what is called the four marks of existence. And this, I believe, is very good for us ordinary people living in secular, living secular lives. And these are here. Okay, so I'm using kind of a, a, a con everyday language. The first one, uh, uh, traditional language is we all experience suffering. So I say life is a bumpy road. Which is different from our human instinctual view. You know, we have instinctually, we think this way. Life is a smooth road or life should be smooth. Life should go our way. So if you, whenever you run into something that you don't like, you're probably thinking this way. Life should go this way. Life should be smooth. But the reality is that life, don't, life doesn't go your way. We all know that in our head. But uh, with the four marks of existence, it stipulates that clearly. 
that again, human life, though it's precious to be born a human being, but you have a lot of things not going your way. That's part of being born in the samsara, in transmigration. Interdependent. Uh, we all, you know, life is uh, comprised of interdependence. The fact that we're here is because we have an institution called the San Jose Betsuin Buddhist Temple. And so we are all, we are, you know, uh, allowed to do things on account of the causes and condition. But we tend to think, you know, life is mine, you know, life, uh, I should be able to control it. This one is easier, life is impermanent, when in reality, you know, but we, even though we know that in our head, we think that it should go always the same, especially when things go well, when things go your way. You know, right now my life is going well, you know, my wife is doing health well and my children are doing well. But eventually, you know, we're going to get old and like my mother who is in a home in San Francisco at 96, she doesn't recognize me anymore. You know, that's going to, and as we visited her yesterday actually, and then my wife says, well, I guess we better start preparing, you know, ourselves, uh, you know. First she said 10 years. Oh, no, I said not 10 years, maybe 20. <laughs> but anyway, that's, you know, um, life um, is going good now, but life is it's impermanent. Impermanent means things change. Things change for the good or according to how you want it, but also according to not how you want it. And, and then, but fundamentally, if you understand the teachings, then life is fundamentally great. So this nirvana you know, is, is, a, uh, is a basic term. And we don't want to end up uh, end our lives thinking that life is lousy. And so uh, I have this one. Uh, I just take the acronym of these and say, think big, don't think small. Okay? And this is my... Probably the only, only thing that I have created in my life. Think big and think small. Actually, one of my students in Japan, I taught this in, in Japan, and they hardly ever ask questions. You know, Japanese students are quite, quite uh, quiet. In a way, it's good for us because we don't have to answer difficult questions. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I actually do want people to ask. But one time, one of the students came, and after I talk, talked about this, and you know, kind of very serious, and 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 I have a question for you. And I was happy, you know. He says, "You spelled big incorrectly." <laughs> There's an extra I. I said, "I know. I explained that. Didn't, weren't you listening?" <laughs> okay, so we will take a break. Okay. okay. So he goes to the vendor, and the vendor says, "Sir, what would you like?" And he says. Make me one with everything. <laughs> yeah, usually this doesn't go over very well. Okay. Okay. Make me one hot dog with everything on it, right? Radish, chopped onions, mustard, sauerkraut, everything on it. But also means, has a deeper meaning. Make me one with everything. Okay? Make me one, the spiritual, mystical experience, sort of. But, okay, that's the first part. The, the reason why the, applies to this one is the second part. Okay, so he gives him 20 bucks, but he doesn't get his change back, so he's waiting and waiting. But he's a monk. He has to be calm and collected, right? But finally he says, well, where's my change? And the vendor turns to the monk and said, sir, the change must come from within. <laughs> so the change is from not thinking this way, but going that way. It always, you know, thinking, changing this instinctual view to one of the four marks. I hope you got the second one. <laughs> okay, so we finish with uh, the... With, uh, wisdom part, and again, this is all part of this phase three of trying to get to the island, um, making an effort 
to reach the island. And so we went through the six paramitas, uh, which can be uh, uh, also seen in terms of three actions, what we say, uh, what we think, what we say, and what we do. And uh, so if you want any kind of uh, guidelines as to, as you climb this path in the everyday world, um, you know, they can be of help, a guideline in how we conduct ourselves, how we treat other people, and how we, you know, um, function ethically, morally, and in the world, and spiritually. So, because ultimately it's tied to your seeking to attain awakening. Um, okay. And I would say that in Japan, and as I said, I'm trying to uh, make the teachings more relevant to the American context, and that in Japan, there's hardly any discussion of six paramitas or perfections. And uh, they go to this level. And, uh, but actually, um, I, I get ex uh, asked to speak at in Japan, and often they want to know more about what we're doing in America. <laughs> um, and so, and I tell them that American Buddhism is only 150 years old. Japanese Buddhism is 10 times long. But American Buddhism began as and continues to be a religion for the contemporary world, a modern religion of modernity. But you know, Shin Buddhism began in medieval times. And, and so it has lots of baggage that it's can. And there are a lot of good things, but also baggage. But in America, you know, we, a Buddhism was for the modern people from the very beginning. That has its negativities, but, but uh, for uh, the, our, our elder brothers and sisters in Japan, they also want to learn from, from America. Okay, so, um, and so this is part of him, you know, swimming to the island, okay? Okay, but he experiences, okay, one, two, three. He feels so cold, he feels so overwhelmed, he gets weaker and weaker, his mind also gets weaker and weaker. Finally, all the strength leaves him. He goes down water. He feels being dragged to the bottom of the ocean. Okay. Well, okay, I'm going to skip this. Some of them. Uh, I, I'm not sure we're going to have time to do this, but uh, okay. So, uh, he finds himself uh, being dragged under, and he's drowning, okay? And this, in a nutshell, is, is symbolic of Shinran Shonin when he was uh, up on Mount Hiei, trying to be perfect, you know, trying to overcome gas. But he found he could not. Because, partly because he was very honest. I think a lot of his, uh, uh, his other monks uh, were, you know, they compromised. You know, uh, they continued to walk the path of the sages. But... Shinran was thoroughgoing. He wanted to, to re, he looked, wanted to be perfect, like the Buddha, but he realized that he was far from it. But for us, uh, as ordinary beings living in the secular world, with you know, uh, with with family and jobs, I think it's the only teaching that makes sense in Buddhism, in my opinion. And so that's why Shin Buddhism. Uh, should be appealing to a lot of people if it's understood correctly. So anyway, uh, he, just to ex, uh, uh, kind of share uh, or feel his sense of, you know, the gap that he felt between b wanting to become full-fledged Buddha and where he was, and, uh, and this is one of his expressions. So maybe we'll read halfway through, okay? Oh, how grievous it is that I, 
ignorant, stubble hair, Shinran, and wallowing in the immense ocean of desire and attachments, and lost in a vast mountain of fame and advantage, so that I don't rejoice always at entering the phase of the truly settled, and do not feel utter happiness at coming near the realization of true awakening, how shameful and regrettable. Okay, so here's, we, we talk about overcoming greed and, and uh, self-centeredness, but here he's admitting, I'm wallowing in the immense ocean of desire and attachments. It's full of attachments. Okay? And lost in the vast mountains of fame and advantage. Uh, by the way, uh, you know that joke about uh, why couldn't the Buddha vacuum under the sofa? <laughs> you don't know this one. And you call... <laughs> okay, you're an American Buddhist, so you've got to know this one. This is an American Buddhist creation. He couldn't, he couldn't vacuum under the small space under the sofa because he had no attachments. <laughs> okay, but... but but he turns to Shinran and says, Oh, Shinran, you do it. And why did he ask Shinran something that he couldn't do it? Because he knew that Shinran had lots of attachments. <laughs> the second part is my creation, so please make sure to mention. <laughs> See, this is the ego, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's a good, good example. Okay, but here, uh, this, when I was uh, younger studying Buddhism, Shin, well, I was in, impressed by Shinran because of his honesty, admission, where a lot of religious people in America were saying, follow me, you know, I'm the only truth. But here, Shinran is making this you know, honest statement about himself and this honesty that, that attracted me. And here is an example. I don't know if you've ever seen this. I, I love this. Amida Buddha, the Bodhisattvas, and they're kind of uh, dragging him, pulling him towards awakening or pure land. And, but here he's resisting. No, I don't want to go. Not yet. You know? And earlier he said you know, he's already settled to go to the pure land, but he's not always overjoyed. And that is the ego part. That is the, the, you know, the uh, attachment to the world. And, that's, yeah, and he has many sayings th like that. Even though I'm promised that, you know, uh, um, being born in a pure land, or, um, but, but uh, I'm not overly joyed and always, you know, always feeling that great joy. Of course, he feels joy, but not all the time. That is what makes him more human. human that I can, I can identify with. Okay. So anyway, um, okay, let, let's go to phase three, uh, four is this here, when he hears that you are fine just as you are from the bottom of the ocean, and this is the Shinjin awakening. This, again, attainable in this life. Okay, just then, Okay, so having heard on a lazy summer afternoon, then So uh, here, letting go, turning uh, on his back, and lo and behold, he is held up. He is embraced by the ocean. Okay, so um, the Shinjin is, again, uh, one doesn't have to be perfect. Um, uh, in a way, 
Shinran realized that I'm one big mess. <laughs> but I'm okay because I'm embraced by oneness. Oneness is amidabha. Uh, oneness is uh, another word for uh, amida. Uh, dharmakaya, dharmata, hosho, hoshin, all this. But amida is an expression of that ultimate truth. And so um, you have these two, two dimensions. So when asked what is Shinjin, it, it, has, it requires awakening to or realization of two dimensions. Two, two aspects, and one is that I'm an ordinary imperfect being unable to overcome gas. If you think you can overcome gas, please try. But again, that is the ultimate, that was the common goal of all Buddhists. But these were for mostly for monks and nuns. But for ordinary beings, you know, it's, it's impossible. If you're married, <laughs> Um, it, it's impossible. <laughs> if you got a family, it's impossible. You know, you you want your kids, and they're 35, and and you still have this inkling that you know they should do what we tell them to do. But you realize that you shouldn't be doing that. But you have this, you know, tug of war, the emotional. So anyway, um, you know, so. So that's why I'm happy that there is a teaching in Buddhism for a person like myself. And I realize I'm full of gas. I'm full of gas. And so one mess. Now, I'm, you know, I, I like play on words, so that's why I, I think I'm pretty, pretty proud of this one. <laughs> one just the difference between M and N, you know? <laughs> And uh, you know Reverend Kubose? He's a very pioneer minister who wrote the famous book called Everyday Suchness. And his son is Sunan Kubose. I'm going to see him in about two weeks. But uh, anyway, he would sign his name uh, on his Everyday Suchness book, which is a really great book, by the way. I think you can still get hold of it, Everyday Suchness. And he would sign it one time. You know, he would sign Oneness Kubose or something. But one time he... Uh, he misspelled oneness. He wrote one mess. <laughs> and the son realized it and told his father, and he just cracked up. You know. just, he says, oh, Naruhodo, it's, it's probably, this is Shinshu. <laughs> you know, and I picked up on that. So one mess, one ness. So uh, even though we're a one big mess, we are embraced in the compassionate circle which, due to the spiritual, which is due to the um, Blessing of oneness or Amida, the other power. These are all words that you hear. Amida, vow, paimo vow, Amida. These are all basically that, that blessing, spiritual blessing that, that is constantly working uh, for us, yet we cannot overcome. Uh, we, 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 we are not aware of as much as we should. And... So that's why my meditation session or contemplation session is trying to address that. So we'll come to that later. So we're here at this point, okay? Uh, now, uh, I, earlier I mentioned, you know, Shinjin is so important, but we have a tradition almost that those who have it don't talk about it, and, but those who have it talk about it. You know, so if I talk about it, and people say, oh, you really, it's not really true. So we are discouraged from talking about it. Do you, in the, in the San Jose Temple, talk about Shinjin? That I, um, if not have Shinjin or understand Shinjin, but just to address the issue of spiritual experiences. But I think we don't do as much as we should. But the problem is because, you know, uh, when you do, people think you're bragging or, oh, you, know, you know, how do we know it's true? So to that question, how do we know that we, we have some semblance of Shinjin? And again, in Joro Shinshu, you know, Rinban Sakamoto is not in a position to say you have it or you don't. We don't do that. In some Zen tradition, they, do, they, they, they may say that. Uh, in fact, I went to a Zen meditation session many years ago. And after three days of session, or five days, that 
the guy next to me who was being hit really hard. You know, in Zen, they hit you really hard because they want to wake you up or, you know, do something. But in this case, they were hitting him really hard because he was getting close to Kenshin, uh, uh, Kensho. Kensho, which, which I think is same as Shinjin, same level, Kensho. So here I was thinking, oh, this guy, he's not doing very well, you know. He's kind of slouching and maybe sleeping. So that's why they're hitting him really hard. But it turns out at the end of the session, these ministers came to him and said, oh, congratulations, happy for you. And that really kind of, is, it's not something we do in Shin Buddhism. You know, in a way, I thought it's kind of nice. Whether he attained level equal, you know, Kensho, I don't know. But these, the, these teachers uh, did acknowledge that. But in Jodo Shinshi, we don't, you know, get really involved. It's basically an individual decision, individual realization. So what I'm saying is that if you have, have sustained sincere seeking of the teachings and entrusting heart uh, in the teaching, you know, in, in trust, uh, you seek and you're sincere about it for a long period of time and you want to come to the temple to hear the teachings, you want to you know, learn more, that aspiration, that already is a sign of Shinjin. That's how I feel. Now, uh, I can't make this into a doctrine, of course, uh, but, but I think it's, you know, I think we can think that way. Have more confidence in your seeking. And the fact that you're seeking is one of the 18th vow. What are the three minds of the 18th vow? They are sincerity, and trust in heart, and desire for birth in the pure land. These are the three minds of 18th vow. 18th vow is the most important vow for us Jodo Shinshu, because that is the teaching that speaks to and addresses Shinjin, or realization, awakening in our tradition. So, do you understand what I'm saying? That this part, uh, well, 18th vow, uh, we'll kind of look at it later too, but um, has, has these three qualities. And so if you're sincere, and if you are wanting to really understand, even though you don't completely understand, and, um, and you basically have a fundamental faith in that the Buddha Dharma will lead you to truth and to lead you to the, the, to the answer as to why we are here, here at all. If you have that, these aspirations, for a, not just for one day, okay? it has to be a sustained period. I can't tell you how long, but you know, a few years, several years, 20 years, 40 years. But if you're sincere and, in, and, and with an trusting heart and, um, and, and really seeking, then that is already the fa a sign that you are within the circle. That's why Shin, Realize that you are already in the circle. So you could, you know, uh, um, so that's why uh, horiz horizontal axis. Everybody, all seven billion people in the world are on the have the same horiz horizontal dimension. And people who seek in various religions and philosophical systems have the vertical. And but Jodo Shinshu, at least. Not that others don't, but Jodo Shinshu is within the Mahayana path of seeking, realizing that I'm already embraced in Amida's vow and compassion. So that's the ocean. So he let go and he, he is embraced by the, the power of the, of the ocean. And so rather than drowning, he is embraced and he's overjoyed. Now he can lead his life. He can't just stay there. So now we have the second swimming, which is the second part here of um, uh, this section. Now you're swimming just like number three, but it's content-wise very different. And we'll talk here. So this is the joy part, going back to five, deep sense of joy. Okay, why does...
Yeah. Okay, so this is that, uh, you know, being embraced and, and the, the ocean hasn't changed. It's the same ocean, but it's less calm, it's warm, and, um, and you feel a sense of being uh, embraced. So here's the hand of the, of the Buddha. Okay, so uh, this is, you know, again, the earlier one, how happy I am. And then also along with it, there's a confidence. Now I'm imbued with the confidence that I will definitely reach the island as a member of the circle of the truly settled. One of the characteristics of Shenzhen is that you feel that you are a member uh, of the rightly established, firmly established. Established for what? You are guaranteed of attaining awaken full Buddhahood uh, upon death. And uh, again, you know, uh, Buddhahood is the aim of all um, Buddhists, especially Mahayana Buddhists. So while we cannot attain that in this life, but we can attain it uh, once this life is over. But more importantly is Shenjin, which is realizable in here, which includes joy and sense of, uh, of confidence uh, that life is fundamentally good then I am blessed, uh, I am grateful, I am connected. These are the feelings that you have. And so as we go to the swimming with ease, you know, you, we have to lead our lives. And so um, you're no longer swimming like it, phase three. And here, okay, I really want to see my family. I really want to see my buddies. When I get tired, I simply let my strength go and entrust myself to the ocean. So, you know, life is not, you know, a bumpy road. And sometimes when you feel stressed out, you're stressed out because you want life to go your way. Uh, and so maybe just let go, you know, just let go. Or don't take, you know, on, on an ordinary level, uh, you want certain things to go your way, but when you really think about it, is it, does it really matter? Does it really matter? I mean, very simple. A lot of times, you know, in Japan, I take the train, and sometimes I find myself rushing to the train, you know, and I said, why am I doing this? Even because I don't have to be, you know, I don't have any deadlines. But some, some, sometimes we have this natural habit of, of rushing and doing things because that's the way we're, we're kind of wired. But, you know, you stop and think and, and say, you know, does it really matter? Is it that important that you get there on time? And um, you know this uh, famous metaphor story that I first heard from Reverend Kodani back when I was younger. And I, I, I have a pen that I brought with me today. It says, does it really matter? And it has, a, you know, this is a well-known story. The Buddha is on top of the cliff and the guy is hanging on a cliff, okay? And he, th he, know, he thinks that the, the bottom of the cliff is 100 yards down. So surely you're gonna you know, grab onto it, but he's barely able to hang onto it and he's running out of strength and Buddha appears and, and he goes, oh Buddha, great, save me, save me. And the Buddha says, I will let go. <laughs> well, what's the... Actually, he thinks the bottom of the cliff is 100 yards down, but the Buddha knows it's only one yard below. <laughs> so he, he's clinging on to you know, dear life, even though he's only one yard below. And that's what the essence of Buddhism, a lot of things that we consider to be you know, life and death is really not that. And, and uh, you're only one yard uh, uh, above the, the bottom of the cliff. D did you get the essence of that? Yes. I mean, please, when, when you find yourself, you know, harried and, and, and stressed out, kind of ask yourself, does it really matter? Certain things are, of course, important, you know, of course. But a lot of things are, aren't that important. Yeah. I try really hard to be here on time. You know, I left much earlier, I got here pretty early, right? Yes. Yeah, because, you know, I, but I thought, oh, if the bar breaks down and, and um, you know, I don't get here and seminar is not held, 
does it really matter? <laughs> for Sumi, it does matter. <laughs> I will be hearing from her for the rest of my life, I'm yes, sure. <laughs> but anyway, but even then, you know, okay, so, you know, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah, you know all those Buddhist hells? Oh, all those, all those. Oh, you mean, uh, okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, at this level, there are, uh, at this stage, there, you know, more virtues or benefits, okay, with... Okay, so when you have more room in your heart, you can see things better. You know, you can think about other people. And in his case, you know, he was so caught up just trying to, you know, stay above water. But now he knows that if he gets tired, he can just let go and the ocean will pick him up, you know, and carry him and caress him. So he has more room to look at and study the stars and the winds. The knowledge that he already had, but he wasn't able to, you know, carry them out because he was all stressed out. So that confidence is, is important. Okay, as the sun rises and he sees the island in the distance, he yells out, here I come. Okay, so the benefits uh, of the uh, having not realized Shinjin or realize that the the, the ocean will not abandon him, you know. Uh, it's already there. It's just that I just haven't acknowledged the fact that the ocean will not abandon you. Just like Amida's compassion, the concern, uh, uh, the, the, the compassionate vow of Amida. So, assurance. One knows that the region island is assured. Energized, one feels rejuvenated, energetic, both physically and mentally. Greater clarity, one is able to utilize his knowledge, his or her knowledge, and past experience to determine the right direction with confidence. So now he knows the exact, much better the, with confidence the direction of the island. Before he was not. Caring for others, with more room in one's heart, one can think about others, especially those friends who were on the ship deck. So all this time, you know, it crossed his mind that, oh, what happened to my friends who were on the deck? with me, you know, but he, he couldn't really, you know, give them attention because he was, you know, he had to save himself. But now he's able to do that. He is able to think about other people, others. And that's the earlier comment that I made. Buddhism doesn't end just with the realization for yourself, but that transforms into realization, helping and contributing to the realization of others. That's why the temple is actually a manifestation of that, that we come here to realize and then we share this with other people. So bringing other people into the temple is one way of benefiting others. If people are interested, welcoming them, you know, opening the teachings, because the teachings are for everyone. Okay, and gratitude. The earlier one that he, she was swimming solely on one's own power, but now realizes that ocean had been supporting him or her all along. That, you know, when we're young especially, we think that, you know, we're, make, we're living on our own power. But uh, as in this case, he realizes that the, the swimming is not just the fact that he is, he is moving his own legs and, and, and arms, but it's the ocean that, is, that, that carries him, caresses him, that makes him able to swim. So the benefit of others becomes much more clear. So that's why you're more grateful. So finally, uh, reaching phase seven is over here. Here's, here's the island. And then, so uh, this uh, symbolically is attaining full Buddhahood, birth in the Pure Land. Stay there. You can if you wish. And again, Pure Land is a whole other category, uh, category of teachings that really requires much more time so I don't want to treat it lightly, but it is the reality to which we return 
or go to. And, uh, and as Buddhas, uh, we attain our ultimate goal as Buddhist, but also we return, phase of returning to this Saha realm and to other realms to benefit others. So, um, okay, and then, okay, finally the sailor reaches the island. Thank you, ocean. Thank you for watching over me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for staying with me. Namo Amidabhats. So you think this is the end, but again, it's not. Having reached the island and attaining jo peace, joy, and energy never experienced before, he sets out on a boat to look for his sailor buddies. This concludes the, the story in a nutshell, uh, which I, I feel explains um, uh, Shin Buddhism in a nutshell. And um, actually, um, are you aware of a Buddhist magazine called Tricycle? Mm -hmm. Okay, that if you haven't, if you don't know it, you, sh you should, you know, check check it out. There are other Buddhist magazines that have come out of you know New York and others. But Tricycle, I think, which I, I like, and and um, I just last uh, was it February, uh, my article on the. On, the, on this story, I use this story to talk about Shin Buddhism because I want to present Shin Buddhism to the wider public. Uh, we know that Shin Buddhism is, you know, great and, and, and we feel it's, it's a very meaningful path, but we need to kind of let more people on the, the, broad, the broader public know about it. So I wrote an article and it was accepted. So if you, uh, in, the, in your resume, you can look uh, at the very end. Uh, I have uh, on the last page, on page six, uh, reference for further reading. So I have um, uh, a site, the tricycle site, and then you can see the article. And then the, the, the pictures are, are much better than this one. <laughs> it's much more realistic. And then also, if you're interested in the Buddhist column, then you can check it out here. Okay, so now what I want to do is um, I want to go back to the uh, Buddhist Nembutsu contemplation. Now, th I think we have, I, I don't, okay, l let me just a uh, few minutes, uh, we uh, entertain questions or comments. I wish you had more time. I, I've been kind of uh, pointing, but I should give an opportunity for anybody to ask or comment or any questions. So far? Wow. Okay. So, so Bodhisattva are... Well, wait, wait a minute. Uh, can you talk louder? Sh sure. Yeah. Um, so you, you talk about Buddha is not staying in the pure land and coming back yeah. to help the rest of us. That's what I know of as a Bodhisattva. So are Bodhisattvas beings that have attained enlightenment and come back or have almost attained enlightenment, but stayed here before going to the Pure Land? Ah, um, <clears throat> well, basically, um, uh, there is a, okay, well, let's see. Um, to uh, put it in, in your framework, you have attained Buddhahood, but you can, you can uh, okay, well, that's a subtle you know, doctrine. You, he, he or she can become a full-fledged Buddha but the 22nd vow says that if you make a vow to, to help others, then you, uh, you return as a, well, I'm not sure, that part is not clear, but essentially if you stay in the world, there's a notion that you're a bodhisattva, not a full Buddha. But I think these you know, distinctions are really not that important, you know, that uh, he, he or she has become a Buddha, and Buddhas help others and work for the benefit of others. But if you want to be doctrinally, you know, and again, there are different doctrinal interpretations. So uh, I think uh, 20 second vow says you return having made a vow as a bodhisattva. Yeah. Um, so uh, you can email me more on, on that point. I'll be happy to, to you know, give you more reference. And so, but, but the important thing is that 
Again, I keep emphasizing that benefiting oneself and benefiting others. They're all part of the same motion. Okay, so that's why at the end, you know, going back on a little boat, now we have uh, more uh, ability to, to help others. Uh, he's not just swimming, but he has a boat to go. And so that, that's another example, being a more like a bodhisattva. Yeah. Okay, uh, so I want to go back to... So if you, if you have a, a purse on your lap or whatever, maybe you want to put it to the side. And uh, uh, we want to, and this is something that uh, is probably, you never, uh, this part, okay, if you see this, what's your reaction? Uh, do you feel positive? You feel angry? A little irked? You see, if you feel a little irked, then you know what Shinran said when he said, I cannot be, I am not, beyond greed, hatred, and ignorance. Um, if a Buddha saw this, probably he would, uh, an awakened person said, wouldn't be perturbed, wouldn't be negatively influenced, and said, oh, so you're a little angry. <laughs> you know, can I help you? You know, but uh, I, I, I don't have time to do this part, unfortunately. Um, uh, these different scenes, they evoke different emotions. And, um, um, you know, uh, this is part of the section where I feel that we need to be more sensitive to our, the functions of our mind. Because, uh, you know, when I... Here, here, oh, here's, here's... This is Chuckle. Uh. She disappeared. These two still come. Uh, okay. Uh. Okay. The, uh, th this is the uh, section that I wanted to do, but I don't have time. Uh, it's about the five skandhas, five aggregates, which I'm using to explore the mind. And, uh, you know, we, we, always, we go through this process, you know, uh, form, senses, you know, five senses that we feel. Right now you're hearing me, seeing me, and then you have feelings either good, bad, or neg uh, neutral. Hopefully it's good. <laughs> and and uh, based on that, you have some thoughts, you know. Um, oh, he's talking too fast, or, you know, he should slow down or something. And then you have intention. Well, man, I'm going to tell him. But then, these are uh, uh, functions of the mind that automatically happen based on the past. So whenever you experience something that this, this kind of process will, will take place instant, instantly. And um, you see certain kinds of people, whatever, you know, and you have certain, we have certain thoughts. This is uh, our prejudices, negative, uh, or our thoughts about certain kinds of people. And they determine how you feel and what you want to do about it. But the bottom line is that this consciousness at the, here is, is the only section, part, that you have control over to some extent. So this is where, when you learn Buddhism, so when you see someone that's, uh, you know, kind of, that you don't like, uh, you don't react negatively. Now, you feel unpleasant, and you feel like, oh, he's, he, he's, he's a troublemaker. But you don't go and, and, and just, you know, lash back at, at him or her. But you are able to kind of respond in a more compassionate way. But this takes training. This takes effort. But it takes basically uh, awareness of how your mind works. And uh, I, I try to practice this as much as possible, but I always find, not always, but less and less, however, but, but still, you know, when s especially, you know, what my wife may say about certain things about me or something, that I, I don't agree with, you know, I find it very unpleasant. But at least I can see it. You know, if you see that you know, your unpleasant feeling or certain prejudices are coming up, you, and if you see it, you're able to not react uh, negatively. Because this part is, uh, uh, is firmer. Uh, 
So anyway, uh, I, again, next time, uh, if, we, if there's a chance. Uh, OK, so uh, I'm going to the Nembutsu contemplation. And uh, OK. six paramitas, the meditation. Uh, and so uh, rather than say meditation, I'm going to nembutsu contemplation. Um, it's uh, the kanji, the Chinese character is a little different. It's kan, guan. One of the three meditation sutras, another meditation, uh, our Shin Sutra is, is contemplation sutra. The, the second, well, I usually plays second. Larger Sutra, Contemplation, or Meditation Sutra, and the Amida Sutra. So contemplation is Guan or Kan. And so I'm just taking that notion in a very ordinary, you know, uh, for us ordinary beings living in the modern society. So nothing really, you know, uh, very uh, uh, official about it. But here, want to return here. So we are living, say, on this vertical level, and, and we have blessings, the physical blessings, the mental blessings, and the social blessings that uh, we receive. And uh, if you're uh, familiar with uh, Cicely Saunders, who talked about total pain, and uh, it's used uh, as a way of just talking about our physical and mental health. And WHO, the World Health Organization, talked about these, and they acknowledged the first three. They talked about the spiritual dimension as being important for your health. And so I've taken this, the, her category and, and, and kind of analyzed or thought about uh, all the, 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 the I, I'm calling it blessings. Uh, they are physical, mental, social, and spiritual. So I would like for you to think about them. So the physical, air, food, water, eyeglasses, medication. As you get older, these really are important, right? <laughs> mental, love of our family, friends, caring of our teachers and mentors, sense of belonging to a community, uh, belonging to San Jose Betsin, gives you a, a mental uh, blessing. Inspiring nature, beauty of nature, and the arts. And then societal is, is uh, looking at it, this from societal, churches and temples, schools, hospitals, fire stations, all these institutions that support us. Uh, those of us who re retired, you know, social security is an important, uh, you know, so, I mean, we say, well, we paid into it, so we should get it. But actually, without the institution, you wouldn't get, have nothing. I mean, there are a lot of countries in the world without that. And the spiritual, this is the, the part. So can you, I hope you can identify with these. Okay. So spiritual blessings cannot be experienced directly like the physical, mental, and social blessings. But spiritual can be seen as a source as well as the as experience as working through the other three blessings. So in Shin Buddhism, spiritual blessing is expressed as Amida, primal vow, or the other power. Okay. The Amida vow, other power, cannot be experienced in the same manner as the other blessings. Now we can't, you know, like the air that we breathe. You know, that we, can ex we cannot experience it. Nevertheless, we can access it through our deeply felt sense of being interconnected and grateful through our contemplation of the three blessings. So um, in order to understand Amida, other power, and the vow, one way is to think about the three kinds of blessings that I just talked about. And if you do, uh, you'll feel a sense of being connected. If you stop breathing for 30 seconds, you'll feel, you know, bad. If you don't eat for one day, you feel bad, you know? And so we all know this in our head, 
but we really don't feel it, you know, literally and, 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 and uh, intimately. And so the contemplation is to, for us to think about this. Uh, but anyway, as we do, we feel really interconnected. We are part, that, that oneness part, oneness. And then if you really feel it, you cannot help but to feel grateful for the blessings that we have. And, um, and you know, you hear this in the sermons a lot, but basically, uh, Nembut's contemplation kind of, you know, consciously tries to, uh, to feel that more intimately as your own issue, not something you just hear at a sermon. And so, and then trying to address the, what is Amida? What is vow? So, the, the, we then take our deeply felt feelings and direct them to Amida by reciting the sacred name or phrase Namo Amida Butsu or Namanda, which literally means I take refuge in the Buddha of immeasurable light in life, or experientially, I am one with Amida. While reciting, we contemplate on the meaning of the 18th vow, and this is the 18th vow. So I'm going to recite this as, as, we, as you kind of recite in the, uh, the, the Nembutsu. And then here, uh, um, now th this part, yeah, we, I hope, I wish we had more time, but uh, the sacred name, when we recite Namanda, Namanda, okay, then you think about what Amida, what does Amida mean? How do you imagine Amida? And we do it in different ways. One is usually like uh, anthropomorphic or person like Amida that you see in the statues or a picture. I don't know what is it in here in the statue. Okay, so that's the uh, human-like form. That's one way of you imagine. Um, other is, is the name itself, Namo Amida Butsu. That is what, how you can imagine. Or as I'm going to suggest is as the Amida as the deeply felt objects from the physical, the mental, and the social blessings that, that we are contemplating. And then finally, Amida uh, vow and other parts should not be understood merely intellectually, but be appreciated existentially as words of truth that was meant precisely for persons such as myself. So this is that first person point that I, I made earlier. If this is not understood as a teaching that is meaningful for persons such as myself, and if you think it's someone else's problem, it's society problem, then you will never understand the teachings. This is true with all re true religions. So here, and Shinran made this tremendous, you know, uh, when I think about the compassionate vow of Amida established after five cups of contemplation, it was meant precisely for such a person as myself, Shinram. And when we do this, I want you, after I say Shinram, I insert your own name if you, if you in your mind. Okay, okay so uh, what I would like for you to do is, we don't have time, much time, but just sit. First, uh, many of you have done mindfulness meditation. Uh, so you put your left hand over the right like this and, uh, and form a, a circle. And you place it gently on your lap and uh, your back straight. The, the back should be perpendicular to the, the ceiling. And, and then you can probably close your eyes is better. Actually, some people leave it open, half open, but close your eyes and breathe through your nose, naturally. And thoughts come up, just let, let them go. Don't attach. Ananda. Namanda.
please continue as I read the 18th vow. I can't hear you. Um, if when I attain Buddhahood, the sentient beings of the Ten Quarters with sincere mind entrusting themselves, aspiring to be born in my land and saying my name perhaps even ten times, should not be born there. May I not attain the supreme enlightenment. Abu Namandabu Quiet, please. Okay, then, please. Um, I'm gonna. Shinran Shonin said, "When I think about the compassionate vow of Amida, established after five kalpas of deep contemplation, it was meant precisely for such a person as myself, Shinran." So now. When I finish, it, uh, please say your name after when I say, please. He who was meant precisely for such a person as myself, Ken Tanaka. So please say your name in your mind, wish. He was meant precisely for such a person as myself. Namanda, Namanda, Namanda. Gasho, please. Namanda, Namanda, what's Namanda, what's Namanda, what's Namanda. Okay, that concludes the seminar. And um, I hope that you uh, will be able to take at least one thing from this session and apply it to your life. Uh, life is definitely a bumpy road, and it's not an easy path. But if you have that strong vertical uh, dimension that we walk, then it will make a heck of a difference in your life. So thank you, and please have a nice day. And